Pakistani state is trying to colonize their land. It also eliminates Pakistan's over-reliance on Karachi bin Qasim complex and their overall dependence on one single port, except for babies. They're hardly producing anything worthwhile. Understanding the complexities of Pakistan, its historical narrative, and its current socio-political landscape is key to understand the geopolitical dynamic in South Asia. Today, we have with us Captain Alok Bansal, who's the director of India Foundation, a think tank. Brings with him a wealth of experience on the subject of Pakistan. Join us for an insightful conversation as we delve into Pakistan's historical and current landscape. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I really appreciate that. It's always a pleasure interacting with you. Thank you, sir. So I would like to start our conversation with a very personal question. I want to understand from you, where does your interest in being a scholar now in the subject of uh, South Asia and being a naval officer earlier come from? Sir? See, I have been interested in history uh, right from childhood. So I, I think I had finished MA history books before I was in standard five. Mm -hmm. So I was to that extent, I think, uh, child prodigy as somebody would like to say. I had finished European history, Indian history and British history before I turned 10. Wow. So I did have a deep interest in history and for a very, very long period of time, I did feel that partition of India was one of the biggest mistakes that we faced. And consequently, there was an urge to know about those parts of India which were partitioned out of India. So I started reading Pakistani newspapers, media, and that started in 96, which is now almost 27 years back. And uh, then it kept increasing with passage of time. And uh, considering the pervasive ignorance that exists about matters defense in India, I thought working on defense issues was a non-starter. Mm -hmm. Because anybody with even rudimentary knowledge of defense could be an expert in India as far as defense issues were concerned. So I thought I should be working on something where others also work and that's international affairs. And as I said, I had a deep interest in this area. So when I started pursuing my MPhil and that was from the University of Madras in Wellington, mm -hmm. I chose a topic which was related to Pakistan, which at that point of time was maybe my wishful thinking it was about prospects of disintegration of Pakistan and implications for India. Mm -hmm. A very widespread topic, but uh, fortunately for me, Madras University accepted the dissertation on this particular subject. And then, of course, once I joined IDSA in 2004, uh, I continued working on Pakistan. And from 2004 to this date, uh, I have a routine that I read at least one Pakistani newspaper from first page to last page daily. Wow. Irrespective of wherever I am, uh, maybe two in the night or three in the night, mm -hmm. but I would finish one newspaper daily. Uh, that's the thing. So it was then started to Pakistan. From Pakistan, when you start looking at it, Pakistan and Afghanistan for last few years have been intricately linked. So from Pakistan, you move to Afghanistan. Right. Being a naval officer, I was forced to work on Sri Lanka and Maldives. And I did visit these countries and Sri Lanka when the ethnic conflict was going on. I did publish a few books on it because that was that. And then slowly I moved into other neighboring states. I had the good fortune of visiting Myanmar, Bangladesh, Nepal and interacting with the leaders and academics. And whilst in IDSA, uh, I think people realize that unlike most IR scholars in India who specialize and focus on a very, very narrow region, mm -hmm. I had the capacity to look at uh, uh, different countries simultaneously and as a result, uh, I think uh, generally whenever they wanted somebody to look at South Asia as a whole, I was uh, generally asked to speak. Consequently, I moved on different foundations. I moved from IDSA to National Maritime Foundation where of course the charter did not allow you to actually look at FPAC region. So I had to look at uh, maybe the coastal arena or right. Sri Lanka, Maldives, Bangladesh. So those countries, one had to look at it. Then, of course, I managed to move to Center for Land Warfare Studies and continue my fascination with Pakistan, Kashmir, the Pakistan occupied territories of Kashmir. And then once I have come to India Foundation, I think uh, I'm looking at all the neighborhood. We have very thriving uh, bilateral relations with Bangladesh. We have uh, 
fairly good relations, uh, regular interactions with Nepal, Myanmar, uh, Sri Lanka, right. Maldives. And of course, I continue to look at Pakistan, Afghanistan and Iran as earlier. So I think that is where my interest in the subject has come. And I think it's continued to grow as you, with the passage of time, you right. know more and more and you like it. So since your scholarly uh, journey started with Pakistan studies, how would you explain Pakistan to someone who doesn't know what this nation is? See, I believe that Pakistan is an edifice that's been built on flawed foundation. Mm -hmm. I think Pakistan was created based on an ideology which is known as two-nation theory. Now, to my mind, two-nation theory is deeply flawed because it says that the Muslims of the subcontinent are a separate nation. And most of the problems that beset Pakistan actually stem from this flawed ideology. Right. Because when you say Muslims of the subcontinent are a separate nation, the first logical question that comes to mind is who is a Muslim? And Pakistan has failed to define who is a Muslim till date. As early as 1953 when there were anti Ahmadiyya riots and two serving army majors were lynched to death. The uh, city of Lahore was placed under martial law. Mm -hmm. Pakistan has been struggling to define who is a Muslim. After that riots, a judicial commission was constituted called Munir Kayani Commission to decide whether Ahmadiyya is a Muslim or non-Muslims. Right. And that particular commission, after sitting for over 300 days, said that they interviewed 23 sets of ulema and asked them who is a Muslim. He says, if we accept the definition as given by one set of ulema, we will have to declare all other 22 as non-Muslims, including ourselves. And since there is no unanimity, this commission is not in a position to decide whether Ahmadi is a Muslim. Right. So this identification problem has remained. The second problem is because of this ideology, Pakistan tried to tell the people that we are no longer Punjabis, Bengalis, Pakhtun, Sindhis, Baloch. We are Muslims and we are Pakistanis. Mm -hmm. They tried to subsume the ethnic identity under a religious identity. Unfortunately, that failed. Bangladesh split away in 1971. Mm -hmm. So we saw and even today you are seeing what's happening in Baluchistan, what's happening in Pakhtunistan or in Sindh shows that the ethnic aspirations of people are arrived. Mm -hmm. Now, today, when Pakistan is trying to push, quote, unquote, illegal Afghans, right. it's causing deep consternation because Pakhtuns believe that they are being targeted unnecessarily right. under the garb of an A. So, that crisis continues. The third major problem was that when you create a country on the basis of religion, mm -hmm. religion obviously takes primacy. In Pakistan's case, the objectives resolution, which was passed in 1949, said sovereignty rests with Allah. Nothing wrong in it. Mm -hmm. See, the sovereignty anywhere remains with God Almighty. Right. But when you say so, you give ulema a right to interpret what Allah's injunctions are mm -hmm. and to counter parliamentary resolutions because they say it's against the injunctions of Allah. And that's why you can counter whatever anybody might want. So that has led to radicalization and the so-called Talibanization and whatever has happened is primarily because of this radicalization that has actually come up. That needs to be countered. And because of these three problems, Pakistan has again suffered another problem. Mm -hmm. That is economic crisis. True. Because firstly, the territory which Pakistan came to constitute was not economically very productive. Mm -hmm. And then what happened because of these issues, radicalization continues unabated. Mm -hmm. The people have got radicalized to a very great extent. And uh, law and order has been disturbed. People have been divided and because of these so-called issues, the population has grown exponentially. Mm -hmm. Please remember in 71, Pakistan's population was less than that of Bangladesh. Right. One of the reasons for Bangladesh's creation was that. Mm -hmm. Today, Pakistan's population is much larger than Bangladesh. Bangladesh was much poorer in 71. But today, Pakistan neither has as much foreign exchange reserves as Bangladesh, nor their per capita income is there. Bangladesh has impeccable social uh, indicators. Right. Their birth rate has come down. They are doing a very good job. So today, Pakistan has failed. And that failure that is happening stems from this flawed ideology. Mm -hmm. because unless, of course, Pakistan dissociates itself from this flawed ideology of two-nation theory, it will find it very difficult to make rectification. So, so what according to you would have been a better solution than a two nation theory in the time of at the time of partition in 1947? See, to my mind, there should have been no partition. Actually, partition itself was flawed. Having gone through the partition, mm -hmm. I think 
a time has come where Pakistan needs to quash this and try and come and try piggyback ride on to the growth bandwagon of India. Try and work towards South Asian Economic Union, which could eventually lead to a South Asian Union. Mm -hmm. The eventual destiny of this region lies in a South Asian Union. And that South Asian Union may be loose union that you can probably can start with some aspects and mm -hmm. then we can grow. But we eventually need. But for South Asian Union to become, Pakistan firstly has to shed this two nation theory, mm -hmm. become a normal nation state. From an ideological state, it has to become a territorial state and also needs to curtail the role of religion in the body politic mm -hmm. because then it will be able to take certain pragmatic, natural decisions. Right. Even at a time when uh, economic crisis is looming large in Pakistan, the Pakistan Sharia court says that there should be Islamic banking, that is interest-free banking. You know, in today's world, is that feasible? No. So that is where the problems of Pakistan are there. And I think we need to understand what is happening. So there was a time when Pakistan was growing faster than other Asian countries such as India and other nations. What changed? What what changed during the time? Pakistan was growing faster than the other Asian countries was in 50s. Right. It was because they had an autocratic regime. Please remember, all autocratic regimes in short term grow fast. Mm -hmm. Be it third reach, be it anything. But autocratic regime in long term are disastrous. That's what happened. Okay. So when they had an autocratic regime for a short duration, in the short term it delivers because there is no democratic descent, nothing is there, you can push things and you can continue to do well. But in mm -hmm. long term, it was a disastrous thing. There's always been a problem of leadership in Pakistan as well because uh, there hasn't been one constant leader. None of their prime ministers has completed their five-year tenure. See, you need to understand the Pakistan's problem emanates right from the beginning. Unlike Mr. Nehru, who chose to become a prime minister and respected constitutional norms mm -hmm. and built up institutions, Mr. Muhammad Ali Jannah decided that he wanted to be the governor general of Pakistan, mm -hmm. which was a constitutional post rather than a political post. Yeah. But despite being the governor general of the Pakistan, he continued to be the president of Pakistan Muslim League and at one stage was even a minister. Right. Thereby, he compromised all three institutions. The second problem was that the founders of Pakistan were those who migrated from India and they had no political moorings in Pakistan and consequently they had no constituency to get elected from. So obviously they did not want democracy to flourish. Liaquat Ali Khan used to get elected from Bulandshahar. He couldn't have taken Bulandshahar to Pakistan. Right. So obviously they didn't have elections. So they undermined the democratic system. Consequently from 47 to 1970, in what is West Pakistan and Pakistan today, there were no democratic elections. Mm -hmm. So you have undermined the democratic institutions, you undermined the institutions of ministers, you undermined everything. And consequently, bureaucrats and defense military mm -hmm. gained power because the politicians could not gain power. And as a result, no institutions were built. And today, with the sole exception of army, there is no institution in Pakistan which is thriving and surviving. So, at, at, the pres at present, Pakistan is going through a massive financial crisis. What do you think is the main reason? One of the main reasons is the, the debt that they take in from the other nations. See, let's be very clear. Pakistan has taken debt. Pakistan, mm -hmm. even in 47 when it was created, was seen to be an economically a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, both Pandit Nehru and Sardar Patel genuinely believed that Pakistan will not survive economically. It will crumble and fall back on India. And this I am not trying to create. There is documentary evidence to suggest that both Nehru and Patel said, mm -hmm. let them have Pakistan, they will not survive, they will crumble and fall back on us. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. They did reasonably well for uh, quite some time, as mm -hmm. you brought out. Mm -hmm. But having done that, today they have a massive problem. They are hardly producing, their, except for babies, they are hardly producing anything worthwhile. Agriculture is horrendous, they have not gone for land reforms. As a result, the rich have lands in thousands of acres, whereas the poor have no land. And Pakistan has had no social structuring. As a result, the chasm between the rich and the poor is really, really very, very deep. Mm -hmm. And that is where we really need to look at it. How do we need to do this? And unless, of course, Pakistan goes for this sort of a social reform, mm -hmm. I think nothing will happen. 
so since i spoke about the financial crisis and how pakistan falls back on their uh, their supports and one of the support is china what do you think is the, the partnership that do you see it as a strategic partnership or do you see only china try to you know take their share more in terms of pakistan see let's be very clear mm-hmm. china seeks pakistan because it needs an access to the sea china pakistan economic corridor is an integral part of bri pakistan looks at a china as some sort of an insurance against india pakistan wants china to get involved in pakistan security that's their basic requirement mm-hmm. they want that china should become a stakeholder for pakistan security and that's why you are seeing this gwadar port etc mm-hmm. where they have tried to provide them uh, stakes is basically they want to make china a stakeholder in pakistan security but there are issues we need to understand that a common man at common level there is a problem ideologically there is a problem china cannot accept the two nation theory and the obscurantist ideology that flourishes in pakistan and as a result you see the chinese citizens have been targeted chinese assets have been targeted so anybody today who wants to attack pakistani government realizes that uh, rather than killing 5 or 10 pakistani citizens pakistani government will be more affected if you target one chinese citizen and that's why you find that all anti government organizations be it baloch nationalists be it sindhi nationalists be it ttp they are going and targeting the chinese nationals and chinese assets there's always been a land dispute uh, between india and pakistan what do you think the relation is at the moment and where do you think it's going see there is no land dispute between india and pakistan we have a problem of the princely state of jammu and kashmir which has acceded to india now pakistan is in occupation of certain parts of uh, indian territory they are in illegal occupation of uh, gilgit baltistan and a certain part of meerpur muzaffarabad now this uh, as i said should belong to us and even the un resolution recognizes that this is part of india pakistan should have vacated it pakistan has not done it i think india is bidding its time and some day we will ensure that this territory comes back to us mm-hmm. so where do you think the f- future of the relation is going india and pakistan see the future of the relation as i said goes nowhere i find there is an existential ideological conflict True. between a pakistan which is a by product of two nation theory and a secular india mm-hmm. so either pakistan has to let go of its ideology then there can be a peace or pakistan has to fragment there is no other way that there can be a lasting peace there can be only temporary rapprochement between india and pakistan as long as pakistan is governed according to two nation theory mm-hmm. lasting peace between india and pakistan is not feasible but it's both ways right even india has that mindset of pakistan being a rival rival nation not really see of course it's an a uh, rival ideology india talks of secularism mm-hmm. that's one of the basic principles so religion has no role as far as india is concerned and you, here you have a country which is created on the basis of religion where you say that the religion is the basis of nationhood right so there is a ideological divergence it's something like capitalism and communism during the cold war era the two ideologies were contradictory inherently contradictory and there could only be temporary rapprochement there couldn't have been a lasting peace between the two of them Absolutely. that's what i'm saying Do you see a similar uh, situation growing in Israel Palestine as as to India Pakistan because that's it that's also based on religion and they're trying to divide into two two see, nations. See, there right? is no doubt that mm-hmm. Israel Palestine and India Pakistan at one stage were similar situations, and as a result, you would realize that India was not supportive of the division of Palestine into two countries. Mm-hmm. Like India was not supportive of Pakistan being created Indian National Congress. and that's happened and in fact uh, this particular conflict is also a long drawn conflict unfortunately israel made certain overtures to palestinians uh, certain peace proposals were negotiated by third par- parties mm-hmm. which have not been uh, adhered to by True. israelis Uh, Camp David, Oslo accord various accords were done now lasting peace is only possible where the two sides agree to either a two state solution or a single state solution but they have to com- be committed to either of the solution mm-hmm. you can't accept a solution and not uh, be committed to it from israel's point of view a credible two state solution would be the ideal and i think they need to work out a system by which there can be a credible two state solution absolutely 
So coming back to India and Pakistan, you know, Pakistan is going through a lot of uh, crisis right now. Like I said, financial, the relation with the, the other countries. What do you think India has to learn from them in order to improve as a nation? Because we have a lot of uh, drawbacks as well that we need to work on. Where do you think we should start and what are the key points you think India should cater to? I think the key lesson that needs to be drawn from Pakistan is that religion should not be the basis of nationhood. Please understand, uh, Pakistan has not been able to define who is a Muslim, mm -hmm. despite Islam having one prophet and one book. Non-Semitic religions have multitudes of religious figures and religious texts. So trying to create a monolith will always be a counterproductive. So you're saying this religion is the main problem in, in India? I have no doubt that religion is the basis of all problems that Pakistan faces today. Mm -hmm. The overt emphasis on religion and trying to put religion into every walk of life has created most of the ills that plague Pakistan. Don't you think India is anyway struggling with, you know, catering to all the religions in our nation as well? Because uh, you see the problem of Khalistan, you see the problem of uh, different... No, I think uh, that's a false understanding. Please understand when India gained independence mm -hmm. in '47, India was a weak nation. Today we are a fairly strong nation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking of country or a state, I'm talking of nation. nation. We are a fairly strong nation today. Today nobody in the world talks of in this integration of India. Remember 1947, 50s, etc. People thought that India would not survive as a single entity. In fact, a lot of texts which were written by the Western authors at that time talked of eventual disintegration of India. Mm -hmm. So we have survived. The policies that we have adhered to of pluralism have held us in good stead. We have built institutions and that institutional framework has ensured that India has not only survived, it has thrived. Mm -hmm. So, to, I know there's, you know, you're, you, you have short time with me, sir. So, I'm going to quickly ask you a few questions to end with. The one would be about your book that is coming out on Gwadar Port. Would you like to tell the audience about your new book, sir? See, Gwadar to me is a Chinese outpost in South Asia. I see it as a Gibraltar, like Britain, Britain has Gibraltar and Mediterranean, whereby they control egress and ingress and egress out of Mediterranean mm -hmm. uh, because they are sitting there. Gwadar allows China that strategic reach. It allows China to monitor shipping entering or coming out of Persian Gulf. And Persian Gulf is the region of immense geostrategic significance that mm -hmm. allows it. Gwadar also allows Pakistan to at least perceive that China has a stake in Pakistan's security. It makes China a stakeholder in Pakistan's maritime security at least. Mm -hmm. It also eliminates Pakistan's over-reliance on Karachi bin Qasim complex and their overall dependence on one single port yeah. or you can say two ports on one same uh, vicinity uh, for their entire trade. So it makes maritime blockage of China that much more difficult for Indian Navy or any hostile power. It also creates problems because it is uh, located in Baluchistan, which is a sparsely populated region where you have an aggrieved minority which feels that the Pakistani state is trying to colonize their land and they see Gwadar as nothing but an instrument of their colonization. And they feel the Chinese are helping Islamabad in colonizing their land and as a result, they, their anger also against China. So this is a book which I try to bring out what is the implications of Gwadar and how the global community should look at Gwadar because this will, this could have enormous geostrategic significance. Wow, that, that book would be a lot of insightful for the audience as well. So to, to finish the conversation, I asked my guests two personal questions if you, if you allow me some. One is, uh, you read a lot. What is one book you wish you would have read earlier in life? <laughs> That's a difficult question and I really actually never thought uh, that uh, somebody would ask me this question. Answer it for yourself. like I am really not in a position to comment on that. Maybe probably I would have said that uh, uh, there is a book by Roderick Macfarquhar, Politics of China, mm -hmm. which I wish I had learned uh, read earlier. I would have known 
the internal dynamics of China better. Because most uh, Indian scholars on China uh, often look at it in bilateral terms or from military terms or international way. Not many of them look at the internal dynamics of Communist Party of China and mm -hmm. its evolution post-1949. I'm not talking about pre-1949, but post-1949, the trials and tribulations that went through mm -hmm. in the higher echelons of political party. I think that book was a good book and that gave right. me a good insight to understand as to how things happen. The second is as far as uh, issues concerning Jammu and Kashmir are concerned. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a lot of books like Ian Kolbamzai's book or some books, which uh, are my understanding of uh, developments in 1947, especially in Jammu and Kashmir was not so good, mm -hmm. which probably I have learned later. So that's what I feel, uh, uh, though I must confess not very many times that I have felt that I should have read this earlier. I have wow. generally been a well-read person mm -hmm. uh, right from my childhood. So uh, that's generally the story. Other than of the subject of geopolitics, uh, the last question could be about your life as well. So it is, what is one piece of advice you would give to your younger self? Could be in terms of your career, or could be in terms of your life, your family life. Yeah, maybe you need to... Give more time to your family. Unfortunately, people who are into academic research, this is one field which uh, you can't divide it between work and home because mm -hmm. uh, invariably your reading, writing continues when you go back home. And in fact, most of your reading is at home, right. unfortunately, because in office you are doing other uh, organizational works. So most of your reading, writing gets done at home. So I think maybe uh, one needs to maintain, strike a balance. And uh, I think we need to learn from Europeans as far as this is concerned, especially Scandinavians, mm -hmm. where they have a very good work-life balance. Right. Beautiful, sir. So it is to spend more time with your family. Yes. Right. Before we go, sir, you have published a lot of books with Pentagon Press. And since we are celebrating 25 years of our establishment, would you like to share a few words about how your experience has been with publishing with us? Publishing with us? See, I... Started publishing with Pentagon only after I came to India Foundation. Mm -hmm. And though I had heard a lot about Pentagon. And uh, I found Mr. Rajan Arya an amazing person. The speed at which he publishes books is amazing. The support that he provides to an author is again amazing. I think for an author, nothing could be more. You get quality work at super fast speed. And that's what you need. My association with Rajan has been so... But after publishing my first book, I haven't gone to any other publisher. Beautiful. Thank you so much, sir. We at Pentagon really appreciate your support. And thank you for your time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to like, share and subscribe. Until then, keep reimagining yourself and know that the power of change lies within you.